But not the end we could have known For the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens Dawns in Galilee. Some say madman, some say king. Wonder working rebel priest. Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Free us 
us all from sin and grave A perfect man would have to die And only he could pay that price Friday's good cause Sunday's coming Don't lose hope cause Sunday's coming Soldiers take him in As his friend betrayed him with the kids There before the mocking crowd
Good morning, Parkside Bible Church. I hope you're doing good this morning. If you are able, would you stand with us? We're going to sing about our everlasting God this morning. Let's sing this together. Strength will rise. so great to be here with you this morning. Parkside, let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. We thank you for the beautiful sunshine that's coming in through the windows here today. We thank you that in every season's change, we can see your faithfulness, Father. We thank you for your son in this time that we have to gather together, surrounded uh, by one another, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are the church, the body of Christ, the Lord, and we thank you so much that it is a message of hope that we can sing this morning, that whatever's going on outside of these walls, it is nothing that you don't have under your control, Father. 
And we thank you so much for this time that we have together, that we can take what we learn here, the times that we have together, the times that we grow more in faith in you, and be able to bring your gospel message to our community this upcoming week with Kids Camp and to the rest of the world as well through the ways that we celebrate and, uh, and uh, support our missionaries here in the U.S. and around the world. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, first of all, I'd like to draw all of your attention to your welcome cards this week. If you are new here, if you are visiting us for the first time, please make sure to pull out that welcome card. There's a little bit of information we would love to be able to get from you so that we can be able to connect with you a little bit more moving forward. We also use those cards for uh, any prayer requests that you have. Here at Parkside, our staff uh, is invested in making sure that we pray over any concerns that you have throughout the week, and it is a great experience every Monday morning with some of our congregants as well who come in and pray with us over those needs that you have. So please, take a minute, look over that prayer card and fill it out, welcome card, if you have anything that you'd like to share with us this morning. Kids Camp is here uh, this week. It kicks off Monday. We will be having a meeting following the service at 11.30, so uh, Pastor Gary has the liberties to go a little over with the service if he wants. We have a good window of time before 11.30, uh, but we're going to try to stick to that time. We could say 15, 20 minutes after the service. However, there are some folks who are showing up just on time for that meeting, so we're going to keep it at 11.30. We'd love to see all of you there. I promise it will be brief. It's going to be a pep talk. It's going to be a uh, last minute uh, information that we need to go over and reviewing the schedule and getting some of our uh, things underway for first thing Monday morning. Uh, unfortunately, Phyllis won't be able to be there uh, at the meeting or tomorrow morning. So she's coming back on family vacation. Apparently there's something going on with airlines. I don't follow it too much in the news, but she can't be back on Monday morning. Barb will continue to uh, fill her spot, but this is going to be tough for me too, kind of a ship without its rudder uh, kind of thing, and I know that it's going to be hard on Phyllis not being here for that first day at kids camp. So please be in prayer for her, safety mer or travel mercies, that they can make it back here quickly and safely, and that they can be here on Tuesday morning as well, Jim and Phyllis. Uh, please make sure you grab one last, there's a couple cards left for Madison's uh, college care package out there. If you grab one of those, we're going to keep the tote there in the office that you can drop those items in throughout this next week still. So please make sure to grab one of those things if you still wanted to be able to help out in some way and donate to that cause. Also, you'll see a plate on the table out there. Those are the last names for the kids for kids camp. Last week, we passed out the plate for prayer requests for each and every kid that will be there. We still had some left over. So please, we'd love to see that plate empty after the service. If you can grab one of those, even if you're already praying for another kid, please grab one of those um, as well. One thing that you need to recognize in your bulletin for the Thursday night Bible study, that's a church-wide Bible study that meets at Pastor Gary's house. We're going to uh, not have that Bible study for this week due to uh, kids camp, lots of stuff going on, things like that. It will commence again on August 1st, I believe, is the date for that, and uh, that will be meeting there once again. So with that being said, if everybody would like to stand back up, and we'll start back into our time of worship. Thank you.
hit by a flood, and I was currently occupying my house when it hit. It was a, it was a big experience for my family. Um, I have five kids. The oldest one is six, so it was a lot to take in for the kids and my wife. The water was just coming up so high that it was about chest level on our five-year-old, and so she was having to walk with her arms up and just crying the whole way to the school. In my basement, it got just over five feet, but we're glad that we're all safe. I was doing okay with everything until I found out Samaritan's Purse was coming. I just started crying, and Samaritan's Purse does so much all around the world, but I didn't imagine them being in Pastor Iowa to help my son. The Little Sioux River runs right through the center of town, so all these homes uh, had uh, basements that were completely flooded, so in those cases, we're gonna pull out the carpeting, we're gonna pull out the flooring, we're gonna pull out the drywall, then we're gonna spray for mold so that the homeowner can come back into the home safely and then be ready to rebuild once they're able to move back into the home. It really means a lot to me and my family to see this because it'll take us a lot to do this ourselves because I know certain companies are asking a lot of money to do just a fraction of what Samaritan's Purse is doing. We just bought the house two years ago and for most of the kids, it's all they know. Six months ago, we had just finished the bathroom finally and we started the process of cleaning it up and fixing it. We replaced all of the carpet downstairs. So it's very emotional now seeing it all gone. You know, we told the kids we have a group of people coming just to help us get the house so you guys can be back in it. And my oldest said, wow, those people must have really good hearts. Now when I go home and my five-year-old cries asking when we get to go home, I get to tell her we're a step closer now. Just having the help here is amazing. But earlier this morning, too, one of the helpers came here and gave me this. My daughter-in-law, it was her grandpa that raised her. And she was afraid she lost everything from her grandpa. I think this was the wedding day, her grandpa and her. And so besides the help, the caring, you know, that Sue noticed that this might be something they might want. That's just extra special. You know, when most folks are fleeing, Samaritan's Purse is going in. And I think that's uh, the embodiment of the people that volunteer to work for them. That, that same spirit, that same desire, that's what God inspires us to do. And that's, that's why we do what we do, and that's why we do it with Samaritan's Purse. Probably one of the most joyful things that we do is we gather with the homeowner uh, at the end of her work, and we present a Bible to the homeowner. Everyone on the team signs the Bible. We kind of walk them through why it was an honor for this team that circled around them to serve them. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you so much. And my children, thank you for telling them, tell them how much that loves them to go back home. I couldn't even finish talking because she was crying and I started to cry. It's just it's a very emotional but very powerful thing. The sooner that the family can get back into the house and have some emotional stability and security. For one mom to coordinate five kids on different schedules, one of the kids especially likes the routine. Most of us do, but to have them be able to go play in their room, to take a bath in your own bathtub, to get it done so fast, is just a, like a miracle. It's just the weight is lifted off of our shoulders. Honestly, I could cry. It's a real blessing what they've done. I'm really grateful for what they're doing and helping us and helping out for what we're going through. Well, that was certainly a very powerful video. video. Very powerful video. Just recently, I have been thinking about some of the things uh, that we could be doing around the U.S. to be able to serve uh, in missions here in our own country. And uh, it was about last January when Bob and Chris Geinzer came here. If you guys would like to stand up and come on up front, please. If you know Bob and Chris, I'm sure you do. They've been involved in a lot of different things here at the church since their uh, first time visiting us and then staying here with us. Uh, you guys came when we were in the gym, correct? Yeah. And now you're here, still at this point in time. So Bob and Chris are going to share with us a little bit about their ministry with Samaritan's Purse, and I'll come back up and talk to you guys a little bit more about what we would like to be able to do partnering with them moving forward. Well, Chris and I, we volunteer for Samaritan's Purse Disaster Relief. And in that video, you saw what was basically Samaritan's Purse calls a mud out where they come in and clean up the home, whether it's been from roof damage or from flood damage. 
Um, we prepare the home so that the homeowner is able to have a contractor come in and make it um, ready for the contractor when he's all done. Other things that we've done at Samaritan's Purse is we've done tree um, cleanup from either from tornadoes or from wind damage. Um, basically, um, safely where we can, remove the trees, remove all of the debris in the yard. We've done debris cleanup where after a tornado we've cleaned up things in the yard, whether it be shingles or building materials or whatever it might happen to be. Um, they also do fire sifting. We haven't done that. And then they also do um, roof, tarping roofs, which basically covers the roof so that the homeowner doesn't have water damage, further water damage in their home. And the one thing about it is you don't need any special skills. Samaritan's Purse is open to anybody. Basically what they need is a good heart. So as Bob said, we serve with Samaritan's Purse, and this is my T-shirt. And you can't see it, but on the, the uh, small print, it says, Helping in Jesus' Name. And that's the ministry of Samaritan's Purse, is we go in, in the name of Jesus helping. Ministering is the most important thing for the homeowner. And then we also serve them by our work. The other thing that we do, Bob and I, st our first deployment was about three years ago. We were in Breathitt County, Kentucky. That's in the hollows of Kentucky. That's where they had a second flood. The river had exceeded 42 feet. Mm. So if you can imagine that. It, so it was a real eye-opener for us. We walked into a mobile home uh, that had not been open in two weeks, and there were three inches of mud throughout the trailer. Furniture was all over the place, mold up to the ceilings. So that was our first experience, and that was just set us on fire for doing what we do. We've also served in um, Fort Myers, uh, Fort Myers, Florida, um, twice in Oklahoma, Mississippi, where they had the devastating F um, five tornadoes in Rolling Forks, Silver City last May, I think, yeah. or actually April. And that was um, uh, Silver City. There was 150 homes. It was a very small community, one of the poorest communities in Mississippi. When we got there, there were 50 homes left standing, and I will say barely standing. So that was also devastating. We were just in Oklahoma this May, and that was for tornado damage. And once again, uh, that was in Bar Barnstall, and that was their second tornado in the last year or two. And that was also devastating. It's devastating to see the piles of rubbish that are that was in someone's home and their home being bulldozed. So you're ministering to people's hearts. You're ministering, giving hugs, um, whatever it takes. The other thing that you saw in the video is we do when we um, start our, to work on the home. We open up in prayer in a circle with the homeowners. We um, tell them all where we're from, and they are always amazed of where people come from all over the United States. We don't know each other most of the time when we do a deployment with other volunteers. So you, get, you really are building a family with the homeowners and the volunteers and the Samaritan Purse staff. When we close with the homeowners, we always end in prayer, as you saw. We all sign a Bible with, and put maybe your favorite verse in it and a little message for them and where you're from. And as you saw in the video, most of the time that is many times where people will just break down. And they give lots of wonderful hugs. There was um, a lady in Fort Myers. She was quite, I will say, a hoot. She was funny. She was a, in her 70s. We worked on her um, double wide. And she had, um, she had been a dance instructor. So we're waiting for some men to get off the, or some people, not men only, uh, get off the roof finishing a tarp, tarping job. Well, we had time, so she was teaching some of us to line dance in her driveway. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty fun. And then what amazed me when we presented her the Bible, she was so touched she had never had a Bible in her life. And that amazed me. Um, and so basically... Um, the other thing we get to do, we get to witness people coming to Christ, and that's always amazing. And in Oklahoma, we got to see the gospel presented in Spanish, and that was amazing. So there's just so many amazing things that God blesses us with. We, um, and so just in closing, they are in desperate need of volunteers. Uh, right now, they have six or seven deployments going on across the United States, and you know, with all the weather events been going on and continue to go on, 
And with hurricane season starting, they are in need of volunteers. And you can be 14 and up. There's one lady that we volunteer with who is in her 80s. She's a short little thing, small, and we see her on volunteering, and the only thing she wants to do is tarping. So if you imagine that. So it doesn't matter your age, like Bob said, or your experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. Stay up here. You can stay up here a second, Chris. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys, for filling us in on your ministry endeavors that you do with Samaritan per Samaritan's Purse. I just love uh, this format for ministry. Basically what it is, they are team leads, and when there is a disaster... Uh, sometimes you go without a team, right, and the team assembles there, or sometimes you could bring people with you. And what I would love to see from our own church family here is that we can have a group of people already set to go when something happens. So um, the Geinsers are going to be going on a vacation for the next month, but they will be back just in time for our fall uh, ministry fair. And at that fall ministry fair, we'll have a table set up with a sign-up sheet, and they can have... Uh, a meeting with all those folks who would be willing to serve in this way of going uh, out and helping out these different regions around the world that have been affected by natural disasters. So that's something that I'm excited about. I'm looking forward to going on one of these trips, and I hope that some of you are uh, as well. Also, Kids Camp every year has a thing called Coin Wars, where they're raising money for a good cause, a ministry that's going on either around the world or in the U.S. here. And this year, we will be supporting the Geinsers Ministry here and Samaritan's Purse with these disaster relief ministries. So thank you guys so much. Can I pray for you and your trip that you'll be taking and then some of the, the next steps that you'll be doing in the fall? Father God, we thank you so much for this wonderful couple. We thank you for their hearts to serve you uh, in this very special way, Lord. We pray for uh, continued guidance as they uh, pursue this ministry even farther going into the future. We pray for your hand at work for those things that we have no idea even what's going to happen just yet, Lord, but you do. And we know that you have put them in this role to be able to serve you and to serve your people. And we pray for a team to be able to be risen up around them as well, to be able to serve in these communities where disaster strikes. We pray for uh, safety and travel for them over these next uh, several weeks as they're going to be putting a lot of miles in on the road, Lord. We pray that this can be a refreshing experience as well and one that they grow more closer to you during this time and closer together. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. All right, you may stand back up, please.
stand beside the heroes of the faith and with one voice in a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain for holy and you are above every other thing, Lord. You deserve all the honor and all the glory this morning. We thank you for this time that we can just sing together as brothers and sisters, declaring truth upon your name this morning. And may you be honored and glorified in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We can get pretty caught up in our own stuff that's right in front of us, but singing songs like that remind us that we have a historic faith that we're a part of, a massive legacy of the gospel that reaches all the way back to the cross. But not just that, we're also looking forward to our eternal faith. We'll be worshiping continually our God who gave us life beyond the grave. That is incredible to sing that together. As we continue in worship, I'd like to invite our ushers down. If you guys would come down and take a seat in these front pews. Uh, as they do that, and in just a moment, so you don't knock them over, I need our kids to come down. Make sure the ushers get through first. Great job. Whew, we made it. All right, kids, you guys come on down for Kids Church. Come on down. Come on down. Great job. Now, guys, because of kids camp coming, your normal classroom is kind of occupied, which means there's stuff in it. So when you get out to the foyer, wait in the hallway, and your teacher will take you where you need to go, okay? Does that work? Great. Okay. I think three of you are listening. Let's pray and you'll be dismissed. Father, we're so grateful for uh, the reality of your son's work in us. Thank you for the cross, which gives us uh, the possibility of redemption. Thank you for the resurrection, which gives us hope uh, beyond our death. Thank you for these kids that are here. Uh, you've brought them, Father, and called them by name to be here this morning. So may they hear the gospel, may they grow in it, and may you be glorified in that whole process. You are good, Father, and you have given us life beyond the grave, and we are grateful for that. In your son's precious name we pray, by the power of your spirit, amen. Let's be dismissed.
Thank you, Kristen and Sue, very much for that music. He is risen. He is risen indeed. It is so good to be with you folks this morning. The singing this morning was just heavenly. And boy, the messages that we sang this morning by way of the songs that we were able to proclaim, it's good for us to teach one another truth, and we do that when we sing. And I just so appreciate being with you this morning, and especially for you folks that are visiting for the first time, you might be here. Boy, it's changing rapidly, too. The political unrest and the uneasiness of both the parties, both Republican and Democrat, are really heating up, and we're preparing for, Lord willing, the November 5th. I know that many of you uh, even attended yesterday in Grand Rapids about the closest that we could probably come to some of the political issues was the rally that took place yesterday in Grand Rapids. And it sure is heating up, and I think it's going to continue to heat up. As you probably heard, um, Phyllis Vanderbilt and family are stranded because the flights have been canceled due to this Microsoft issues. And I'm not a techie person. All I know is there are flights and banks that were shut down, and when that happens, things are not good. Uh, this week, if you kept up with the news, Yemen, uh, the Houthis, that uh, are planted in Yemen were involved in an Israeli attack on Tel Aviv and Yemen uh, paid the price where Israel reacted and responded and knocked out one of their ports. 80% of the weaponry that the Houthis received from Iran go through that port and it's no longer there. And with all of these changes that are happening in our world today, uh, I'm reminded of a number of passages of Scripture. But in this changing world that we are living in, it's good for us to go back to some of the foundational principles that God has established from the very beginning. I know that some people think that, well, you know, because we're living in 2024 and we have AI and we have all of the technology that we have, that we're so sophisticated that we think that we're kind of moving into a new era and the past is the past, and we need to now get up with the times. And I would like to suggest to us this morning that instead of embracing that approach, that we rather go back to the foundation of some of the principles that God has established from the very beginning. We started a three-week series last week on the image of God. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 1. The very first book of your Bible, you don't need a page number because when you turn to Genesis, you'll find that being the beginning of the scriptures. In fact, that's what Genesis means, beginning. And in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, we find here God's word presented for us in the creation account. Now, make sure that you remember that Jesus used the creation account in Genesis chapter 2. He quoted it when he taught about marriage. We believe that God's word is inerrant from the beginning to the end, from Genesis to Revelation. We believe that the book of Genesis, even the first 11 chapters, are authoritative, and they are, thus saith the Lord. God created. We did not evolve. God created man and woman in the garden. We find the account in Genesis chapter 1, where six days he created and we find the account in verse 26 beginning there. Follow along as I read verse 26 of chapter 1. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, 
I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw that he had what he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. We go back to the foundation of creation. And we want to restate this important principle that we have lost in our civility within our culture today. There's this element in which we have lost the reality that humanity, both male and female, are created in the likeness, in the image, in the reflection of our creator. We are God's great creation that he has created in us. Again, this past week, uh, Sue and I, on our day off on Friday, we went out to the pier and we sat out across from Big Red with our chairs and we had lunch. And we sat there enjoying the beauty of Lake Michigan, 321 miles from north to south, about 118 miles width. It's a massive lake, miles and miles of water. And as I sat there and took in the creation account again and looked at the sky and, and the, the sun and all that God had created, I've seen the trees that are just huge that we see blossoming and growing in summertime. Everything just, the language of creation pours forth a language of praise and it just pours forth an adoration of creation, creator, creator. The creation pours forth this language of praise. And as I sat there and took in all of this creation beauty, I was reminded yet again of how wonderful and beautiful the people that are created in his image, both male and female, <laughs> at least on Friday, I didn't have to look very far because she looked pretty good. <laughs> She's created in the image of God. And we find that the image of God is planted deep within your soul and with my soul this morning. As we continue, we'll come back here to Genesis, but I want to take you to, to Psalm 139 for just a moment because you and I are, are woven together, and we're going to talk in a couple of weeks about the reality of life and where life begins in conception. We believe the Bible teaches that life begins at conception, and we'll deal with that in a couple of weeks. The implications and the ramifications of this image of God that is in you and I go deep on not only how we treat one another, but even maybe on how we even vote on November 5th. I mean, it, it affects that much of our life. And I love Psalm 139. One of the great passages that reminds us of who you and I are in the image of God. Verse 1, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. Skip down to verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in that secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Look at verse 17. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. What a beautiful passage that gives the reality and the value of human life. 
you and I are created in the image of God. And we are God's wonderful creation. Yes, creation is one thing out there, pours forth language, but you and I have something unique. We are in the likeness, in the very framework, in the very reflection of God. I came across this this past week. I don't know if you're tired today, but when I read this, I identified with it because I'm human. If you're an adult of average height, Here is what you accomplished in the last 24 hours. Your heart beats 103,000 times. Your blood travels 168 million miles. You breathe 23,000 times. You inhale 438 cubic feet of air. You eat three and a quarter pounds of food. Some of us eat more. You drink 2.9 quarts of liquids and you lose 7 eighths pounds of waste. You speak 4,800 words, including some unnecessary ones. And that depends if you're male or female. We won't say anything else. You move 750 muscles, your nails grow 0.00046 inches. Your hair grows 0.0171 fourth of an inch. Thank you, Ken, for cutting my hair yesterday. And you exercise 7 million brain cells. Do you feel tired? (laughs) Just within the last 24 hours, those are some of the things that your human body does, and we don't even think about it. We're not even aware of it. You and I stand, friends, as a reflection, a reflection of the Almighty God. And I'd like to ask you the question this morning, how do we reflect God? In, in what ways do we reflect? This morning, I'd like to share with you just two out of three. Two of them today, two weeks from today, I'd like to share a third one because it deals with male and female and it deals with headship. And we're going to deal with that because Genesis deals with headship. Go back to the beginning. We did not evolve. God created And there's a way in which we reflect the very person of God. In what ways? There's three, and I'd like to share with you two this morning. The first is that we are in and like God by way of having a personality like him. God has a personality. God is a person. Even though he's a spirit, John tells us in John chapter 4, And John says also that in chapter 1, verse 18, that he's the unseen God. In fact, he says no one has ever seen God. Uh, How can a spirit have personality? Remember the story of Moses in Exodus chapter 33? After God comes to him and says, I am who I am later on in the text, Moses confronts God and says, show me your glory. I want to know more of who you are. And God tells Moses in this passage, he hid Moses in the cleft of the rock and the glory of God went by the cleft of the rock and Moses was shown the backside of God because God told him in that passage, you can't look at my face and live. No man can see me and live. God is a spirit, but he has personality. And God is beyond many times our thoughts and our ways. God is God and there's none like him, the prophet Isaiah says. God is a personality in a number of ways. Number one, God has intelligence. God has intellect. He has a mind. He has thoughts. Look at what the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, verse 9. Isaiah says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13 on the screen. I have this for you. We can, who can fathom the mind of the Lord or instruct him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right path? 
Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? And later on in this passage, he says, surely the nations are but a drop in the bucket. Our God stands above all others. There is none like him. And in this same passage, he says, with whom then will you compare God? There is none that compares to the God Almighty, the creator, that wove us together in that secret place in the womb where he put us together. God has intellect and so do we. We are created in the image of God in that we have a mind and we can think and we have an intellectual ability. Ryrie in his book, Basic Theology, describes it this way. When God created man in his image and likeness, he made him like himself, a rational being with intelligence. To be sure, human intelligence is not the same as divine intelligence, but it is a real intelligence, not fictitious. Therefore, humans have the ability to understand the meaning of words and the logic of sentences and paragraphs. Sin has removed the guarantee that human understanding is always reliable. But he says, but it does not eradicate a human being's ability to understand. You and I are created in the image of God because we have a mind. Your brain weighs about three pounds. And because you can think and you can intellectually work through issues and understand language and paragraphs and sentences, we are like God in that respect. We have a brain. We have a mind. We're not like the scarecrow of the Wizard of Oz looking for a brain. No, we have intellect. And because God has personality in intellect, we too are created in that image. There's a second way in which we're created in his image, and this might surprise you. Even though God is a spirit, God has emotions. God has feelings. And some of us might say, but, but I thought because I'm human, I have emotions. And God doesn't have emotions. No, God is an emotional spirit even though he doesn't have a physical body. He has emotions like joy, anger, sadness, disgust. It's interesting that Aristotle's list of emotions included 14 distinct emotional expressions. He listed these 14. Fear, confidence, anger, friendship, calm, enmity, shame, shamelessness, pity, kindness, envy, indignation, emulation, and contempt. One of the emotions that Aristotle did not mention was one that the scripture oftentimes speaks of in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 24, in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 16, in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 9, chapter 6 verse 15, and in Exodus chapter 34, God says this, do not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. <laughs> I learned what jealousy was many years ago when I was dating my girlfriend, Sue. And there were guys that would come up and talk to her. And when I went back to school to Grace Bible College and became a student of Dr. Sam Vinton, she was back in California and I was here in Michigan. And she had contact with some of her friends in high school. She's taken. Don't talk to her. <laughs> and I had a jealousy, a streak of jealousy that ran through my heart. And, and we know what that kind of jealousy is. God is a jealous God. Now, he's divine. So his jealousy stands a lot different than your jealousy and my jealousy. But... Nonetheless, he's an emotional being. God is an emotional being that he has created us with these emotions. It's interesting that a daily life, our daily life is profoundly emotional. They did a study many years ago back in 2015. 
And they found that participants experienced at least one emotion 90% of the time and frequently experienced positive and negative emotions at the same time. In case you were wondering, the study goes, the researchers didn't find any gender differences in their results. Men and women in the study experienced a very similar frequency of emotions on a daily basis. Because oftentimes what we say is, yeah, you women are always emotional. And us guys, we're more rational. We're more thinkers. And in the study, they found out that that wasn't necessarily the case. So whether you consider yourself emotional or not, the truth is everyone is emotional. The question is, what do you do with your emotions? You and I are emotional beings created in the image of God, and we have these responses of our soul that are connected and also a reflection of God himself. God has placed us together in this personality, not only with intellect and emotions, but thirdly, and maybe more importantly, God has a will. That is, he can choose. And we know that because God is a holy God and a righteous God, he always chooses correctly. <laughs> but we have been created in his image, and now we are moral issues. We have moral issues that we need to choose, and what is right and what is wrong. Because God is a moral being who is consistent to himself in his holiness and righteousness, he is perfect in all of his ways. God is holy, as we sang earlier. But we are moral beings with the freedom to choose. And unfortunately, here's where the story goes south. Because we're related to Adam, and we go all the way back to the ancestry of where we have come from, Adam disobeyed. And in that choice, he threw us into a state of rebellion and disobedience and what we call sin, which is saying no to God and saying yes to self. It's all about I. The I in sin really defines who we are. And now our makeup is such that we are bent not to doing the right thing, but we are bent to doing those things that are contrary to the very character of God. Man did not lose his moral nature through the fall, but he did lose his original righteousness. John Whitcomb says it this way, this is a theme that dominates the entire Bible. Men and women, humanity are responsible moral agents before God and can never reject this accountability by arguing that since God is sovereign Lord, of history, they cannot make genuine choices. Just because God is sovereign, God has created us to choose. That's part of the image of God that reflects who he is. If we were but just robots, we wouldn't be in his image. But because we're moral agents that have the, the opportunity to choose, we reflect the very likeness of God. And this is where, my friend, the gospel comes in and it penetrates to the very core of our being. Because we are in this state of sin and we have chosen to disobey, God now gives us a choice to choose to come out of that by way of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is where the gospel invades our world and says, I will not leave you in this state. I'll now give you a choice to choose. What will you do with Christ? And ultimately, that is the million-dollar question. What are we going to do with Christ? Salvation is the act of God's grace and kindness Revealed to us because he loved us. His emotion of love was not just a feeling. It was a feeling, a sense of commitment that demonstrated itself by giving himself to us. But God demonstrated his love to us in this. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so we find the personality here of how we're woven together as a reflection of who he is by way of our intellect by way of our emotions, by way of the choices that we choose. 
But let me take you to a second way that we now reflect the very likeness of God's creation. And that is, we not only have personality, but we have social likeness. We have social likeness. Let's go back a moment to Genesis chapter 1. Take your Bibles and go back to Genesis chapter 1. Let me call attention to a couple of verses. One that we read. I hope that you noticed here in verse 26 that there is a plurality of God speaking. In fact, the very first verse of Genesis chapter 1 gives us a hint of the plurality of God. In the beginning, God's plural singular created. There is in verse 1 of chapter 1 an indication that there is a plurality within the Godhead. We see it in chapter 1 verse 26 that we read earlier. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And I want you to notice that it's almost like God is speaking to himself. That God is having a conversation with himself. Let us. Who's the us? Now that we have progressive revelation, we know that there is a father, there is a son, and there is a Holy Spirit, three in one. And now we know because of the progressive revelation of God's word that Jesus Christ came into the world and he makes statements like this. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so we find that Jesus Christ claimed himself to be God. And when he made that statement in John's gospel, the Jews picked up stones to stone him because they knew exactly what he was claiming. He's calling himself to be God. And he was. Not just 50%, not just 70%, not just 90%. Jesus Christ was fully God in human flesh. Fully man, fully God. Here's the triuneness of God revealing himself through Jesus Christ. And now that Jesus Christ has gone up to heaven, how do you and I know that these things are true? How do you know that the past is true? God gave us now his Holy Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit, we live in the age of the Holy Spirit, the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. When you put your faith and your trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit now comes in and lives and dwells inside you and I as believers. What a reality. What a truth that we have. And here we are in this reflection of God in so many different levels, not only in our personality, but now socially, God has created us for relationships. And when sin came into the world, loneliness, isolation, seclusion, solitude, abandonment, all became part of Adam and Eve. When they sinned, what did they do with God? <laughs> they tried to hide from him. And how is that working? Are you here this morning trying to hide from God? Uh, he doesn't see me. He might see me on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, but he doesn't see me on Friday night at 8 o'clock. And we, we try and hide from God, which the psalmist tells us he's an eternal being. He's omnipresent. He is how? Through his spirit. And the Holy Spirit shows us and reveals to what God is doing in this dispensation of grace. The Trinity becomes an interesting subject for us to grapple with. Augustine said it this way, if asked to define the Trinity, we can only say that it is not this or that. Spurgeon says it this way, nothing will so enlarge the intellect and magnify the whole soul of man as a devout, earnest, continued investigation of the whole section and subject of the Trinity. How do we explain three in one and one in three, the Godhead? A.W. Tozer says it this way, love and faith are at home in the mystery of the Godhead. Let reason kneel in reverence outside. J.I. Packer says it this way, the Trinity is the basis of the gospel and the gospel is the declaration of the Trinity in action. You and I have been created to have relationships, not only with one another, 
but ultimately with God. God created you, and you have been created like a hand in a glove. You and I have been created to have fellowship with our creator. And what sin has done is it has separated that. And death has come in, not only physical death, emotional death, but also spiritual death. You see what sin has done? See what sin has brought? See where we're at in a world that has fallen, but it's not left to its sin. And here's where the Trinity shows itself in such a glorious way. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever chooses, believes, puts their faith in him. If you believe that Christ is who he claims to be, fully God and fully man, and he went to the cross on your behalf, and you put your faith and your trust in Christ, that decision has multiple layers of implications on your life. And we find here that God reveals to us the reality of who he is, the unseen God, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Alan Coppedge describes it this way, God, because God is a social being, people are also social beings. By definition, individual people are incomplete in themselves, and therefore, they need no other persons. And by the way, what he's saying is that we need to have relationships with each other. We also need to have a relationship with God. What sin does is sin convinces us that we don't need him and we don't need others. I can do it myself. Huh? And so he goes on in this quote by saying, this is probably why God designed and created persons, male and female, so that an awareness of their individual incompleteness was built into their very being. While God himself transcends sexuality, he is completed by the triune relationships within his own being. So that persons would not miss this lesson. Individually, They are either male or female. Each one complements and completes the other. So the Trinitarian perspective on creation carries significant implications for human relationships. That is so true. You and I have been created as social beings. You need other people. We need to be around other. Community is so important. And not only community with one another, but it ultimately begins with God. Quoting my son-in-law, Matt Loverin, who wrote a, a paper, Biblical Christian Thought, he sums it up well by saying it this way. The image of God then is best understood as the capacity for relationships that human beings share with one another and with God as their creator. And so we find that the relationships that we have with one another is nothing more than a reflection of the very essence of God's heart because God, one God, has a community of three within that one. And you think and meditate on that whole concept of who God is in that triuneness, as Spurgeon says, that's good for us to grapple with. We might not be able to understand it, but it's still the reality of who God is and how he's revealed himself. And we come to the third way in which we describe God's image and likeness. And because of time, we're going to take this third one and we're going to push it down two weeks, Lord willing, if we're here. And I say that because I'm looking forward to the rapture coming and that's a whole other subject. But if you come two weeks and we're not here, (laughs) here's the notes. I hope you're not left behind, okay? But what we're going to do uh, two weeks from today, Lord willing, is we're going to look at the headship likeness. The headship of male and female and the headship that is, that is described here in the book of Genesis really describes for us the reality that there's a headship within creation because there's a headship in the person of God. And we're going to look at that and see the importance of that in a couple of weeks. Also, what I'd like to do a couple of weeks from now is I'd like to have some conversation and also some biblical discussion with you about some issues that are related to this theme of the image of God. Number one, 
I'd like us to consider the theme of abortion. And I believe that biblically we have some passages of scripture that help us understand what the Bible teaches about abortion. I don't want to get political, I want to get biblical. And what I want you to know and I want you to have is I want you to have a biblical perspective on these issues that are up front and close to us every day. And Lord willing, we're going to talk about abortion because it's connected to this whole theme of the image of God. And the implications run deep. I'd also like to have some conversations about homosexuality. Not because it's a biblical issue, or not because it's a political issue, but it's because it's a biblical issue of God's design for family. And I know these are hot issues, these are hot subjects in our in our culture today, but we need to be biblical in some of our thinking. We need to see what God says about marriage, about what constitutes a marriage, what constitutes a family. And we want to look at that, and we want to discuss some of that theme of homosexuality. Thirdly, I'd like us to think and consider, what does this image of God mean for us when it comes to transgender and the transgender movement? Is there something that God has to say about this theme that has come in and rose to the surface since basically 1948? There is a moving of the earth of God when Kinsey wrote some of his books that he wrote about sexuality back in 1948. And our culture has swallowed that theology. It's false, but we have swallowed it line and sinker, and we are now today dealing with these issues because of some of the material that Kinsey wrote back in 1948 that we are now paying the price for. And we need to see what our sexuality and what the Bible says about our sexuality. Fourth, another subject that hopefully we can touch on is the racial prejudice that results in this lack of biblical and foundational teaching of the image of God. If we believe that God says what he says about male and female being created and all of the races are equal, then the prejudice that we find in our world today and some of the things that are happening by way of putting certain people above other people, getting to the point where we say, you know what, we've got to annihilate these people because they aren't human. And if you don't believe that, just go back to World War II and do some history of what Hitler came to believe about the image of God. These are important issues. These are important things for us to grapple with. And Lord willing, we'll attempt to take a look at some of these social, biblical issues in a couple of weeks. Before we close, can I close with one last passage of Scripture? Would you turn with me to 1 John chapter 1? 1 John is found way in the back of your Bible, and 1 John is one of three books that we call 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. The Gospel of John is written by the same author. He was the close disciple of Jesus. Peter, James, and John were the close three of Jesus. They had an inner circle here Jesus had with these three. I thought about this passage as I was thinking about the image of God this past week, and I was reminded of how John states this in 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, that is the word, he says in John chapter 1, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared and we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. I want you to notice here that John says this, we saw him, we heard him, we touched him, we had fellowship with this one called the Word. The Word became flesh. The second person of the Godhead became flesh, were created in his image. He came in the image of the Father. We have seen him. And John writes these things 
so that we might know who God is. Because when you've seen Christ, you've seen the Father. And by faith today, I ask you, where's your faith? Do you know that first you're created in God's image and you are very, very special and unique? And you're unique in that he became human flesh and he did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. We couldn't save ourselves. Our righteousness, the prophet Isaiah says, is but filthy rags. And Jesus Christ came into the world to pay the penalty for your sin and for my sin. The full God man died in your place and took the place of your sin. And when you believe that and you embrace that and you say, I believe, you now become a child of his and you're born of the spirit. You're born again. Have you been born again? Jesus asked Nicodemus, what, do I have to crawl into my mother's womb and be physically born again? He didn't understand. Do you understand? And do you know that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? Today, friends, I beg of you, I urge you, I encourage you, if you haven't taken a step towards Jesus Christ and you haven't put your faith in him today, I encourage you to do it today. Don't lay your head on the pillow tonight without praying to him and asking him for forgiveness and asking that Christ become your Lord and Savior and that you put your faith and your trust in him. The time is short. The days are short. He's coming again. And when he comes again, he's not going to come on a donkey. He's coming on a white horse. And when he comes on that white horse, you are going to see him in all his glory. Every knee, every eye, every tongue will see him for who he is. Will his hands be the hands that saved you? Or will they be the hands that sends you to an eternity separated from him? There's a choice. You're in his image. Choose well. Choose Christ. Put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heart and your head with me this morning as we close? And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I pray this morning that you know that you are valuable and you are created in God's image. You have intellect, you have emotion, you have will. You and I are social beings and we need to have each other, but we especially need to have the creator that created us. Our sin has separated us. If you haven't put your faith and your trust in Christ, I ask you this morning, why not? What's holding you back? I believe that Christ died for my sins, was buried, and rose again. I receive him today as my personal Savior. I'm so thankful that I'm born of the Spirit. Thank you, Father, for your Son, and thank you for the Spirit that now indwells and I pray, Father, that you would bless any decisions that are being made here in this auditorium or even being made live stream. May your gospel continue to go forth, Father, not only from this pulpit, but send us forth from this place as ministries, missionaries of your gospel, that we might have the chance to share the gospel, especially with these 175 kids that are coming this next week. And then, Father, for those that we work with, that we live next to, our family, would you open up doors of opportunities for us to let them know in a grace-filled way, yet in a truthful way, who Jesus Christ is. Thank you, Father, for the name that is above every name. You're a great God. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So thankful that you were here this morning. Uh, we pray that you'll be able to participate in the fellowship afterwards. We have coffee and some time. At 11.30, all of the servants that are involved in the kids' camp ministry, we're going to be meeting here in the auditorium. I would ask that when you come in at 11.30, please come towards the front so that we can have our meeting that Pastor Jerry will lead. Come to the front so that we can kind of rally. I think there's about 120 servants that I heard was the last number. We've got 175 children, and we've got 120 of us. They outnumber us, but we're bigger. <laughs> so shake a hand before you go. Uh, you're dismissed. Have a great day. We'll see you back at 1130. <clears throat> <laughs>